Uh, I'm Brian Kono, and I'm, I teach in the theology department. I'm the assistant professor of youth ministry. And um, what I'd like you to do as I give a little more introduction is grab a piece of paper underneath. There's a, a kind of an outline of my dissertation and then some blank pieces of paper that are just scrap paper. And here's what I want you to write on on the, on the scrap paper. I want you to just draw three circles that are touching. That's all the direction I'm going to give you. Three circles that are touching. You can use whatever color you want. So I did my, I completed my PhD at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, and it was a, a, a doctorate of philosophy with educational studies as my emphasis. And my topic for my dissertation, which is what I'll be speaking on today, was really spurred on by a covenantal epistemology I read by Esther Meek. In her book, uh, Loving to Know, she unpacks and really interprets Michael Polanyi, the, um, the philosoph philosopher of knowledge, that's kind of his emphasis, John Frame, um, Stanley Hauerwas, Jürgen Habermas, James Loder, and Parker Palmer, and she puts all of these together to say, this is how we come to know what we know. And her, this is, it's a very extensive work, and it just really intrigued me to think about how we learn, how we understand God in the midst of revelation and knowledge, and especially as a person who is an educator, how we understand the process of helping someone else learn. And so I put some of what I, I read in her work into um, a study of youth ministry students, and you can see at the top of the other sheet I gave you, the outline, the, my interest specifically is um, looking at critical thinking and how it relates to youth ministry and youth ministry education. So the title of my dissertation was A Portrait of Critical Thinking, Perceptions Among Youth Ministry Students and Their Professors. So I just want you to real quickly show me, show your work, show me your, your drawings. You have three circles there. Interesting. So some of you just created them and made them just barely touching, and some of you drew them overlapping, um, kind of creating a Venn diagram picture. And I'm, I'm in one of my one of the things I would do at this point. I was I would ask the question, why? Why would Jonathan Rink draw them overlapping? And why would Elise Underwood draw them as just touching? And not all three touching together, but just three like in a line, so each one are, are, are touching. And I would, um, in this context, I would want to understand what is it that has pushed you to draw those that way? What, what part of your knowledge or the processing of that information or, or even insight that you may have had in the process of drawing those that made you draw them the way you did? And actually, I had you draw three circles because um, in my study of the literature of critical thinking, there are three areas or three concepts of the learning event that I, I um, used as a framework for my interviewing of youth ministry students and asking them about the, the way they understand, the way they learn, the way they think about youth ministry. In, in essence, what, I, what I've proposed is that in critical thinking, there are three textures or three layers that overlap. And much like a picture, when you put um, color next to one another, even though they are two distinct colors, those, when you're standing back, those colors blend at certain points. And those textures be begin to create something that wasn't necessarily intended or always intended. But out of that, some kind of transformation, something unique happens and there's the, another texture that, that comes into play. And so, so the three layers, whether you, three circles there might represent kind of what I'm, what I'm talking about today. So if you look at the notes I've provided for you, the three textures I found in the literature for learning um, or critical thinking, as I've described them, these are not necessarily the distinct that you would, you would see them discussed this way. But I've kind of drawn from the literature and said, this is how we might understand critical thinking. 
the best. Traditionally, the, the first two layers would, or textures would be knowledge and process. Knowledge has to do with facts, information, the things that we study, even the, the ideas, coming to college, the ideas that we have already stepping foot into a classroom. Um, they have to do with not just knowledge and facts, but belief and what we believe about what is true and what is right and what is good. It also, that knowledge texture, also includes a layer of our experiences. The, the way that we have experienced the world around us and we've drawn out, out of that information and ideas that we have also put in, resident inside of our knowledge, which is separate from book learning. It's the experiential learning. And then there's also a, a kind of a undergirding layer behind all of this and in this, this knowledge texture, there's the layer of our perception of what is true. And, uh, and really, traditionally, that might be believing in an absolute truth or a non-absolute truth, the uh, relativism or, or pluralism. And I'm not going to go into much detail explaining that. But that's, that's the, the texture of knowledge I, I found in the literature. The second texture is the, the processing texture. And this has, has to do mostly with taking information, taking experiences, and making them work. So it's much more practical. It's when you've learned something in class, and then you're going to go out, and you're either going to write about it, or you're going to apply it in some way. So in youth ministry, this would be the going into a, um, a setting for a church or some other other contexts and applying the principles, ideas, and the theology and the theories they've learned in the classroom and going and applying them in a this particular setting. It could also be in the classroom where we take case studies or talk about ideas and say, so what does this look like? How does this work in the real world? So the processing texture is that the second piece that is very common in the literature on critical thinking. Probably in the last decade, maybe just, just over a decade, a third layer, or third texture rather, of critical thinking has really come into play. And I've, I've uh, discussed this as the intrapersonal layer. And this is um, where probably Esther Meek and her, her, uh, her writings on, on different theorists has really guided me to propose a unique aspect of the critical thinking or learning event, and that is the interpersonal layer. And in this layer, um, you, would, you would separate yourself from your knowledge and separate yourself from the processing of the knowledge, and you would step back and say, why is it I have the feelings I have, the attitudes I have toward these particular things? Why is it I was guided to think this is the right way to do something? Why is it that I felt affirmed or, or, or even disaffirmed and uh, avoided these particular ideas or concepts? Um, so it's, uh, it's the stepping back and reflecting on thinking. This is, this is what you might call metacognition, the, a third layer or third texture of the, think, the, the learning event. It's in this layer that I've identified as um, where we interpret our emotions, and our reactions to, to things around us. It's this layer also that um, is the sudden aha moment, where out of nowhere, not based on anything that I already know, something comes in and, and, and makes things click, where you say, oh, I never thought of it that way before. Michael Polanyi would say that's a part of a tacit knowing. But Esther Meek calls that a, a, a relationship with knowledge that, is, um, that helps us expand who we are and expand our, our ever um, learning transformative event. The third layer that I bring into this, this uh, um, texture is that of our spiritual influences. And this is something that as Christians, as we, whatever discipline we're from, we believe that God is involved in the learning event. God is involved in helping us understand information. Whether we're doing so individually while we're reading our Bible or reading a textbook or thinking, trying to think about some ideas to write a paper, 
um, or whether we're doing that communally where we are having conversations about different ideas. In those moments, God is present. A spiritual influence is present to help us guide, to trust, uh, whom we can trust in to guide our thoughts and our, even our emotions and to bring us inspiration in the creative event. Um, I kind of think of this as the, uh, wow, um, as what happened to the Apostle Paul when he had the transformational moment, where he had all of this knowledge already, and Jesus broke into his world, and really for the next several years, he had this reorienting of his world to say, this is everything I've understood one way, and now I've got to think of it in a completely different way. And God continued to guide him through that, that transformation, that learning event, to help him understand in a, in a new way um, his own faith. Um, so broadly speaking, that's what I discuss in my, my dissertation. Um, um, the nature of my PhD is such that we try to make it very practical, and so I, I did research with, with youth ministry students who were graduating, and I talked to them about how their thinking had changed from a freshman to as they are graduating, getting ready to move on. And through, through group interviews and individual interviews, through discussing with their professors and looking through um, syllabi, I came up with um, some objectives and practices that would be important to those who are educating to help guide specifically youth ministry students. But if you look through these, you'll see that probably every discipline could benefit from thinking about the education event um, and incorporating some of these practices and objectives. So I'm going to highlight, how much time do I have? Maybe a minute? Okay, I'm going to highlight just a couple of them and, and take, field some questions. The first thing that we should, um, that pr the two objectives that go hand in hand are objective number one and objective number two. Epistemic understanding, meaning um, understanding what is right, true, and good, and how we understand what is right, true, and good. Sorry, that's on the back of your sheet of paper. Um, and then interpreting our experiences, because we live in a day where our experiences tend to be the priority, the most important source of knowledge. And um, through, uh, through some of my research and also through, through uh, the l literature, um, we, can't, we can trust our experiences to a certain point, but there has to be some kind of objective um, orientation for us to trust in a greater authority outside of our own experiences. And while that sounds very non-postmodern, actually even many of the secular philosophers are recognizing a much more objective, um, they would not say necessarily absolute truth, but a much more objective truth that is involved in our world and in the learning process. So those two, epistemic understanding and interpretive experience, both go hand in hand, I believe, in the, the, uh, the learning process as an objective for professors. Uh, another one, I jumped down to objective number four, and that is imagination. Um, imagination in the learning environment, in the classroom, um, allowing place for creativity, uh, and identifying that creativity as something that even God is doing um, in our world, in our immediate moment. Um, and I, and I, so I would connect that with objective number six, bringing God to the surface, that we as professors might talk more about how God is helping us learn and even taking pause and saying, hey, right now, as we've just, I've just introduced this information, what is your immediate reaction to it? How is it that you would agree or disagree? How does this, does this in any way help you understand yourself, um, understand or appreciate God and his character in a new way? Um, so, so those two objectives go hand in hand. Um, and and uh, one of the practices I would encourage is um, the professor-student relationship, which is something I think we do very well here at Spring Arbor University. Um, and with that, I'm just going to close and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, John. Yeah. I was thinking in one of your last objectives, you mentioned epistemic understanding. Mm-hmm. 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 Hmm. Uh, professor of mathematics at the University of Michigan. Yeah. Now there's the new, new atheism where 
scientists are beginning to understand that we're not going to rule out the possibility of this being, mm -hmm. but for you, let's just not do God. Mm -hmm. Let's include everything else, but let's just not do God. Mm -hmm. And so there's this movement from the absolute hate of just this mm -hmm. to this swing mm -hmm. in their thinking and understanding that right. there could be. Now it's, I just right. want to do God, right. but it's a new relativism is kind of what, what philosophers are calling it. Yeah. Yeah. I found it very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right. Thank you for your time.